Hello, we are here for the second episode of Love It or List It. If you are new to my channel, if you're new to the series, Love It or List It is kind of what the name implies. I basically read four books that I choose from prompts that I give myself or I've gotten from my patrons. Of those four books, if I love them, I can keep them. If I don't love them, then I have to list them on Pango. Like I said in the first video, which I'll have linked below, I also have linked below a playlist of other people who have done similar things to this, where they're basically reading their TBR or unhauling those books that they haven't read or that they're not liking. There's also Becca's TBR challenge, which is this TBR will self-destruct. So whatever you put on that TBR, you have to unhaul it after a certain amount of time that you've given yourself. So Love It or List It is very similar to those types of things. It's just that this shelf right here is what I'm choosing from. And this shelf is everything on my TBR that is from 2021 or older. And essentially I'm picking four off this TBR and we vlog it, we see how it goes. And in this video, we will finally get some Patreon prompts. One of the two prompts is less so a prompt and more so we started an impromptu buddy read on the discord and that is for the unbroken so i will grab that once i get through all of the prompts so starting with the prompts that i'm giving myself i said in the last video that i want to try to do one nonfiction in every single one of these videos i have a lot of nonfiction on my shelves now is the perfect time to pick those nonfiction. so one of them will be a nonfiction book the second prompt that i wanted to give myself is to finish a book that i started and put down at some point so there are a few books on this shelf that i have have started and read a few chapters or read a good chunk of the book and I just never finished it so I want to pick one of those books up and then the fourth prompt was given to me by Natalie and one of the many prompts that they gave me was book with the smallest amount of reviews on Goodreads and I think I already know what it is without even having to look at my shelf but I will double check on Goodreads okay let's go through my shelf <laughs> Broken, I have a stack of books here that fit the prompts. These four here, which we have Pet, Son of the Storm, Master of Gin, and Friday Black, which is a collection of short stories. I have started all of these at some point and have made it at least a quarter of the way through all of them and then just put them down. Part of me is leaning heaviest towards Friday Black and Master of Gin, mainly because Friday Black has been on my TBR for so long and I've made it through. I mean, I think I've annotated this at some point. Oh yeah, so the Finkelstein five, I gave five stars and I annotated a little bit of this short story. This short story actually lives rent free in my head probably because I've read it like two or three times. <laughs> but the other part of me has really been wanting to read A Master of Gin. Like I know not everybody has loved this, but I've just really been wanting to read this. It's a mystery, but it's in a fantastical world. I really love P. Jelly Clark. So I'm torn between these two. So we'll we'll sit on this for a second. As for nonfiction, I really wanna read Black Girl Unlimited. This is Echo Brown's memoir. Um, I know that there are fantastical elements in it as well, but it is for the most part their memoir. So this would count as nonfiction. And I really wanna read this. It's been on my TBR also since it came out. Um, and I just love this cover. And then I do have to double check, but I'm pretty sure Running With Lions by Julian Winters is the lowest reviewed book on my Goodreads. So this is indie published. I remember when it came out, like, did this come out in like 2018? 2017? When did this come out? It's funny because I was so excited for it when it came out and then I just didn't read it. It came out in 2018. So I'm pretty sure this is the lowest reviewed, but we are gonna check on Goodreads right now. Apparently, <laughs> I'm wrong. Well, in a shocking turn of events, Blood of an Exile has the lowest amount of ratings that would be on the shelf. So I guess I'm reading Blood of an Exile and not Running with Lions. Awkward. <laughs> I was really looking forward to that. Okay, so I guess we're reading that. Blood of an Exile, very unexpected turn of events. Okay, as for choosing between these two, what do I do? What do I do? Okay, so here's the thing. Now that Blood of an Exile is on the table, which is a fantasy, it's not super chunky, but you know, the Unbroken is pretty chunky. 
This is like 400 pages. We're gonna go with the short stories. It's been on my TBR for long enough. I've picked it up multiple times, so I think this probably should be the one anyway, because I've only attempted to read this one other time. This, I swear, it's been like three different times, and every time I get to a different place in the book. So this time, we're gonna just read it. And it's weird that I keep doing that. It's not weird. I am not a short story person. Like in a collection with one author, I usually can't make it through the short story collection. Collection. This is very known about me. And yet here I am still buying short story collections. The series is where we learn and we grow. Okay, so the final TBR is Friday Black, which will be for the prompt of a book that I have started and then put down. And then to fill the nonfiction prompt, we have Black Girl Unlimited. And then for the prompt of the lowest amount of ratings on my Goodreads, Blood of an Exile is actually that one. You know, not running with lions. It's Blood of an Exile. And then The Unbroken, which will be for my impromptu Patreon buddy read, which is a prompt in and of itself. This is the weird hodgepodge of books that we're reading. This is like science fiction. These are fantasy and this is a memoir of sorts with a little bit of magic. I know that we have weird lighting right now, but all I can say is like, I'm just so excited that the sun is still out and it's almost seven o'clock. I just can't explain. I can't express how happy that makes me. It's just desperately what I needed in life because depression is already hard enough. I don't like what I just did to my hair, but what, <laughs> whatever. I finished Black Girl Unlimited and I don't think I have a rating for this because there's a lot of trauma in here and it's weird to say you enjoyed a book that is so full of trauma and that just made you cry a lot, mainly from the trauma and the circumstances this main character is experiencing, but also how there's like this light at the end of the tunnel and it makes you feel like there is some hope for this character and for Echo Brown, because from what I understand, this is supposed to be like a fictionalized memoir. I don't really know what that's specifically called, but from what I know, it's when the majority of this is true or real or based off of the real events of the author's life, and they're fictionalizing certain parts of it. Actually, one of my favorite books, Black Flamingo, which I have all these tabs in here. This is similar where it is part memoir, part fiction. Um, but I think this probably leans more on the memoir than maybe Black Girl Unlimited does. Um, and I only say that because there is what you could say a urban fantasy type of twist in here, type of element in here. Yeah, even the back says part memoir, part magic, Black Girl Unlimited is a transcendent coming of age story and an unforgettable debut. So this obviously follows our author, Echo Brown, and you're seeing her coming of age, basically. And she's coming of age in really tough circumstances. So her mother is addicted to cocaine and alcohol, and she doesn't really know how to function without these substances in her life and her stepfather is addicted as well, but he was the only man in Echo's life to step up and raise her and call her his daughter. Her real father, you kind of get a little bit of background on him, but he's not around. He's not a very good person from what is being described here. And Echo has some brothers that are varying in ages and they're also trying to just kind of make it. But Echo is very determined to get an education and determined to go to an Ivy League college. And so her main focus has always been like basically surviving within her family and helping take care of her mother in ways, but also just trying to survive and get out of the situation that she finds herself in. And for her, the way to do that is to study and get good grades and to get out of the situation by getting a higher education. So right off the bat, you know that Echo is very smart. She is a straight A student. She's up for valedictorian and you know that that part of her life is thriving, but all of the other parts of her life are not. A really common thread in this book is the way that black women are treated, specifically for Echo. It's her experiences with other black men treating black women a specific way. And so the magical part of this, the urban fantasy part of this comes in because Echo and her mom and a collective group of black women are what she refers to as wizards. And they can see this black veil and they see this black veil over people who are kind of wanting to do evil or who have experienced situations that have made them kind of 
withdraw from this world and to feel really displaced and not protected in this world. So they have figured out ways to protect themselves. And a lot of times that's withdrawing and putting this black veil over themselves. So Echo and this group of women, including her mother, can see that black veil and a situation occurs in Echo's life, which is a sexual assault. You do see it on page. And this really changes Echo's relationship with herself and how she comes into being a wizard and being able to understand this black veil and understand miracles and how these miracles come to be because they are wizards and how these women are constantly coming together and saving each other. So obviously you can assume that wizardry is black women, right? It's the magic of them being able to come together and protect one another. And it's a really interesting metaphor and I like the way that she weaves it throughout the story because to me that's a really beautiful metaphor. I love the way that Echo views the women in her life regardless of the mistakes that they've made, regardless of the harm that they may have caused each other because they recognize and they see in one another that there's this black veil that is the way that patriarchy and racism and just colonialism has shaped how they are treated and has shaped how they interact in the world and try to protect themselves. But they come together and always try to protect one another regardless. There's just this sense of women coming together and really supporting each other and really lifting each other up even in the worst circumstances, they're fighting for one another. I hesitate to say that I enjoyed this because it wasn't an enjoyable reading experience. I do think that it really, it did something to me. I was crying at various points in time. It's very sad. It feels very bleak at times. It feels very helpless and hopeless at times. And then at the end, you have this moment of light and people healing and people coming together and realizing things and trying to grow and change and be thankful for what they have and who they have. And you feel this sense of hope for Echo. And I think it's just very reflective, like the tone and the reading experience is very reflective of what Echo is experiencing. I think that when an author can make you feel how the character is feeling in these moments, it's really reflective of a great writer. So I'm really glad that I read this. The thing is, I just don't know that I would keep this because I'm not sure that I would ever reread this. I don't know if I would want to go through the reading experience again, but yeah, I'm glad that I finally got to this one. And then the book is downstairs, but I have finally started Blood of an Exile. And I'm gonna tell you, I don't like the audiobook, so I'm gonna try to read this one physically, which may or may not be a bad thing for me because, you know, physically reading hasn't been my strong suit this year. But so far I read or I listened to 5% of the book and I'm interested. I am definitely interested. I like the tone of this book, but the narrator just makes it so boring and clinical. I feel. So I'm not enjoying that experience, but I definitely am going to try and read it physically. I also think I'm going to tackle my messy bookshelf. Okay, should I show you? Because it's like, um, it's kind of dark, but yeah. Uh, it's a situation that I, that I have going on. Hey friends, I'm long overdue for an update because I have been in the worst reading slump. I haven't been in this bad of a reading slump in a while. I have literally not read for weeks and I just kind of read at things. It's taken me many, many weeks to just finish small books um, and I've been DNFing a lot. So this may not come as any surprise, but I actually don't know that I talked or prefaced about this particular book I'm about to talk about, but I'm gonna have to DNF the unbroken. So the thing is, is that I know this video is like, if I don't like it, I have to unhaul it. But I think because of my reading mood, I'm going to DNF this for now. So I'm not going to get rid of it quite yet. But part of me is like, maybe I should because the preface that I don't think I gave in the beginning of this video is this is my second time trying to read this book. And if we're actually being real, this is like my third attempt because 
my first time reading it, I definitely wasn't in the mood for it. And I got like 70 pages and I realized I didn't know what was going on and I had no connection to the character. So I just put it down and I was like, I'll get back to it at another point in time. And so I was planning a buddy read in the Patreon where we were all gonna read this because so many people wanted to read it for the release of the new book. So I was no different. It was perfect to do it for Love It or List It because it's been on my TBR for two plus years. In comes attempt number two. I, at this point, get to 100 pages again realize I don't know what's going on and I have no connection to the character so I restarted it. I will say I got to a hundred and 152 which is chapter 14 on my third attempt and this time I do understand what's going on but I have no connection to the characters but again I'm in a really weird reading place so I'm like do I not have a connection to the characters because that's just how reading is going for me right now or is it the book? And I've heard a lot of mixed reviews. Like I have some friends who absolutely love this book and love the characters. And I have some friends who really hate this book and hate the characters. So I'm not sure what to do in this situation because I still really want to love this and I really want to give it another chance. It's not one of those situations where I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to give up. It's more of, I just really want to love this. I just really wanna love this. I think this is just gonna be a DNF for now, which means that I'm not listing this, but in a future Love It or List It, when I am in the mood for this book, I have to read it in that Love It or List It. And if on my fourth attempt, <laughs> I can't get into this book, then I just have to let it go. That's just what it is, okay? So that is my promise. Mark my words. Why am I having an existential crisis about things that I'm placing on myself? I don't really know. I don't know. I'm falling to pieces in my room. Are you coming over? That's cool. I could use a little something to do. We could go outside, take a little ride if you want to. That's cool. What I supposed to There's nothing left for me to do So now I'm poking out my head Through open windows Cause that's what I feel like Do it tonight Waking up my brain Maybe you can do the same You want me to say something I come up with nothing Maybe we can talk until we figure out a topic Been so long and sunny day i love the rain but like i was in desperate need of a sunny nice day it also made me really want iced tea so i got a subtly i almost said subtly subtly or subtly peach sweet tea 
and um, I am very excited because it's 85% less sugar than other teas, but it doesn't have any artificial sugars in it, which I don't really care either way, but I don't love like super sweet tea. I don't need the extra sweetness from an artificial one because I don't need it to be super sweet. Anyway, let's try this. I keep thinking we're in 2024 for some reason. Every time I read an expiration date that says 23, I'm like, it's expired. No, it's not, bitch. We're not in 2024. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Actually here because I have a package. This is from the sweetest human being, um, Aiden one of my patrons who had an extra copy of a special edition of Amina Al Sarafi and sent it to me. I just like, what did I do to deserve you? Any of you, really, anyway, let's open this. Wait, is there something else in here? What is that? Aiden. Wait, this is so cute. What is this? Whoa. Whoa, it lights up. <laughs> what? That is so cool. <laughs> what is this? You could charge it. Is it just like a little decoration? <gasps> it's different colors. Wait, what color will it be now? Green. How pretty is that? Thank you. Wow, okay, I wasn't prepared. Um, I think all of these have gone out, so I think everybody who would have purchased one should have gotten it by now. But if you did not receive your special edition of Amina Al Sarafi, then maybe look away because I'm about to open it. <laughs> Ooh, oh, okay, it's already so much prettier in person. Oh my god. Wow. Big fan. Big fan. Oh, whoa. <laughs> I'm not even that big of a fan of sprayed edges, but these are cool. This map. Oh. Oh, I have seen this art. Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> There's too much happening. Oh, this is really cool. Okay. This is so pretty. They did such a good job with this, but the thing I was like freaking out over is this artwork. This is so pretty. Oh my God, there's foiling on it too. Anyway, this is so pretty and I'm pretty sure that's Amina. I can't imagine who else it would be. Oh, and the cat. Wow, this is so pretty. Thank you so much, Aiden, for sending me this. I really, really loved this book and I'm so excited for this series. I'll probably have to just buy the special editions of all the copies if they do that, but wow. Thank you. Hello. Okay, so I've been reading Friday Black. I literally just finished it minutes ago and I needed to update because this was such a wild ride. Um, I ended up taking my time with this collection because I realized as I was reading some of these stories, I didn't understand what was going on. In some cases that did not change, that feeling of not understanding what this story is trying to convey or maybe just vaguely understanding what's happening in the story. Um, continued it continued to be something i struggled with throughout this collection but there were like five short stories in here maybe just four based on my dog ears there are four stories in here that were my favorite that i feel like i understood and that i could kind of talk about otherwise the overarching message of this collection i feel is very much making social commentary on race and racism specifically in the united states you could definitely feel that tone um, specifically in the very first story, which is called The Finkelstein Five. And that is one of my favorite stories of this entire collection, if not my absolute favorite story in this collection. It 
is like an apocalyptic, futuristic type of world where you can put your skin color, your blackness, if you will, on a scale. Um, and so in the beginning, you meet a character where his whole goal is to keep his blackness at a like one to two. It means that he's a respectable black man and that white people won't take too much notice to him. But progressively throughout the story, you're seeing that scale not matter as much to this character because of some of the circumstances in his city and the way that white people are reacting to it. So this short story is interesting because it's interweaving like two different timelines and dynamics. So like you are getting the perspective of this character that we're following for the most part, but there's also this trial happening at the same time. And this trial is very much related to why this character starts to question why he even cares about the scale. It was such a powerful story. I think the message in here is something that can be conveyed throughout all of these stories. But again, because I struggled with some of the meanings and the plots of some of these short stories, I can't like definitively say that. So um, that was my favorite story. That was the one that I felt that I understood the most. What's interesting is that the other ones that I loved in this collection have a similar theme to one another. So there's Zimmerland, The Lion and the Spider, Through the Flash. Um, this one, Through the Flash, is a little more... I feel like hopeful, which is interesting because it is um, one of the last stories in this collection. And it brings a little more hope and levity to I feel the rest of this collection. But overarchingly, I think the Finkelstein five and the four other, three other? Yeah, the three other stories that I mentioned have very similar themes where it's all about trying to control how people view you and what the world views you as and what that means for you and how you have to navigate the world. I think that's just generally a theme in here. Um, obviously, you know, you see in every story there is the subject of racism, there's the subject of white supremacy, um, colonialism and police brutality is very big within this collection. And so I see that through the entirety of this collection, but I just really struggled to grasp everything in here and it makes me want to reread it and see if things make a little bit more sense. But Finkelstein 5 was definitely like the standout to me. It's the one I remember the most. It's the one that as soon as I read it, I was like, oh, I'm going to love this collection, which I did really enjoy the collection despite not having the best grasp on things. I do feel like the writing in here is so amazing and so well crafted. But generally, this is very weird and unsettling. And especially right off the bat with the Finkelstein 5, like it starts out very unsettling, continues to be unsettling, but I feel the last two stories have a little bit of hope to them. And I think that's something that recently, like even reading Black Girl Unlimited, when you can feel exactly what the author is trying to make you feel, I think that speaks so much more to the writing than like maybe writing that's really lyrical or overly flowery. I tend to really enjoy and appreciate writing that makes me feel so much like what the characters are feeling. And especially when an author is like trying to make you feel a specific type of emotion to convey a specific type of mood and they do it so successfully that like it almost infects you as a reader. I think that's a sign of good writing for me personally. So I don't have a rating and I don't have an idea of what I want to do with this. If I want to try again at some point and reread it to take it slower and get a better grasp or if I just need to move on and hopefully read something else by this author. Um, I'm not quite sure of their backlist or if they have anything new coming out, but I'm going to check that out actually. Good morning. Good morning. I'm doing my eye patches because I don't know, I've finally been sleeping decently, but uh, you know, those puffs. Anyway, I'm now a quarter of the way into Blood of an Exile and I'm gonna make myself a smoothie. While I drink that, I'm going to read Blood of an Exile. You know, I'm enjoying it. It is dragon book. So that makes me happy, but they do kill dragons. So it's one of those types of dragon books. You know, there's two types. There's the type where the dragon is the enemy and the type where the dragon is the friend. And I'm always looking for a friendly dragon situation, but uh, this isn't it. So anyway, 
I'm gonna try to read as much as possible today. My goal is to finish the book tomorrow because I'd really like to get it done before we start my Patreon readathon. Also, I've just been working on this video for far longer than anticipated because of my reading slump. And I've been working on like two other videos for the same exact reason. So I feel like I'm scrambling to get everything done in the time frame that I wanted to get it done. But not only that, like the time frame doesn't really matter that much to me at this point. It's more of I've been working on these projects for a certain length of time and I'm ready to wrap them up and get them out into the world type of thing. You know what I mean? I don't know if that makes sense, but um, my hope is that I'll finish it tomorrow. if not a little bit further than 50% into Blood of an Exile. And I think the last update that I gave you, I was talking about how the audiobook is very dry. It's very dull. So I switched to reading it physically and it's definitely a much better reading experience physically. So I highly recommend that, especially if you are an audiobook lover like me, it's not, it's not the way. It's funny, this book kind of reminds me like the tone and the pacing of it really reminds me of Robin Hobb. The writing is nowhere near Robin Hobb level and I'm not even attached to the characters in the same way that I am with Robin Hobb. And I'm not even talking about how far I'm already into my Robin Hobb journey. I mean, I was attached to Fitz in the very first book right from the beginning and I don't really feel that way with these characters. I do think that the queen in here, she is my favorite character and I really love being in her perspective. Her perspective is absolutely the most interesting and I am the most attached to her. Second would be our second main character, Burchard. I really do like his character. I'm just not as attached. Like I, I enjoy learning about him and I do think that his overarching story is compelling, but I like when we're in his perspective, I don't care if we move away from it, I guess. So right now, this is kind of leaning at a 3.5 stars if I had to give it a rating right now. Part of me would want to round this up to a four stars purely for the dragon because it really does have a lot of dragon stuff in here. And it's not just about like killing the dragons. They're trying to understand the dragons. Our queen is trying to save the dragons. And I think that's all so well done and so interesting because I don't really get a lot of dragon books where dragons are integral to the plot. So overall, this book is very much about Burchard. Like even the synopsis focuses on Burchard because I think that his story is going to open up this world a bit more and then I think it'll turn into something else in the next two books. But essentially you're following Burchard and at this point upon meeting him he is the most legendary dragon slayer. You quickly learn that he used to be a lord and he was exiled and basically relegated to only being a dragon slayer. So his whole life up until this current point in time when you meet him has been finding different dragons and slaying them otherwise he will get killed. So this is why he's the most notorious and legendary dragon slayer mainly because his life is kind of on the line um, but he's also just a badass the ways that he's described um, some of the scenes the battle scenes that are described he's definitely a badass I think there's some underlying stuff there that we haven't really been introduced to yet or hasn't been revealed as of yet but I think there's some hints at it because I recently just stopped a chapter where they're kind of hinting at something and I'm very curious about where that's gonna go. But right before the king dies, who is Ashlyn's father, she's now the queen, she's the one that I was talking about before where I really like her character, he asks Burchard to go on this very specific mission to kill an emperor and once he kills this emperor, he'll basically be released from exile and he can walk free and live his life the way that he wants to. Although he will not be given his titles back, he will be a free man. 
So Brichard takes this opportunity. In the midst of him taking this opportunity, you find out that Ashlyn and him have a past, um, a romantic past, and I think they're both kind of in love with each other. She ended up marrying somebody else, but her husband died, and she is now a widow, so when they do see each other, it's a little reunion of sorts, a romantic reunion. <laughs> but Ashlyn has some plans of her own. She is very much a protector of the dragons. She is not necessarily a fan of the slaying of dragons. And at this current point in time, she's kind of doing scientific studies to figure out how certain dragons tick and how the old magic was connected to these dragons in the past that doesn't really exist currently. So I really like her perspective because you get to learn a lot about these dragons. You get to learn about this old magic that doesn't really exist in the world today, although it's arguable that it doesn't exist because people don't know how to manifest it. So it's really cool to see her studying the dragons and also studying this ancient magic. There are a few other perspectives that are tied into the story, but they're um, closely tied to either Bernard or Ashlyn. Anyway, I'm enjoying this. Um, I just think it's a 3.5 because it's really easy for me to zone out. It does feel very old school fantasy. Like it has that slow pacing. Things are slowly coming together. There's a lot of ancient magic. All of these characters are tied together in some very important way that's probably connected to a fate that we haven't, you know, foreseen yet. I guess the writing the pacing was just very reminiscent of Robin Hobb for me. Like as soon as I started it, I had the same feeling as when I started the Farseer trilogy, but it's by no means the same. So don't expect the same thing. I just mean like, I think it has that like classic slow fantasy vibe where in the Farseer trilogy, you're not super focused on necessarily a magic system. It's more about the politics and looming threats. Um, and primarily about the characters that you're following. And this has a similar structure to it. So that's the only reason I got those vibes. There's, don't go into this thing, it's Robin Hobb. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Hello, so we're in front of the shelves, which you know what that means. That's the end of the video, but also I finished Blood of an Exile. This ended up being a 3.5 stars for me. I'm definitely gonna move on with the rest of the series, despite this being a 3.5. I'm actually very interested in the world and the characters. I think there's just something about the writing in here, which I kind of mentioned before. When I was listening to the narration, it felt a bit dull, dry, a little boring. And I noticed that even while physically reading it, it wasn't necessarily the narrator that was making it feel that way. There is just like a dry tone. It's very slow. <laughs> Um, there's not a lot of action in here and I'm not necessarily super connected to the characters. So if you're new to my channel, I am fairly character driven. I do read first and foremost for the characters and then the plot. So for this, I think it's just that I see the potential in these characters, but I wasn't like instantly connected to them. I feel like Ashlyn is the only one that I immediately liked off the bat. Burchard is one of those like stereotypical fantasy male characters. So there's nothing really to write home about with him, but I do see potential in him and I like him and Ashlyn. Not that they're a couple, but they've had history, they have a past. So I'm interested to see how that's gonna play out, um, especially with how this book ended. But the thing that makes me really wanna move on with the series is I love the world building and dragons, okay? There's so many dragons in here. I'm not saying this is my perfect dragon book by any means, but this definitely has a lot of the elements that I'm looking for when I want to read a dragon book or a book that claims they have dragons. This definitely has more interaction with the dragons than a lot of other fantasies that I've read. And the world building is just really phenomenal in here. And I can't imagine what this world is gonna continue to look like. So that's really what's pushing me into wanting to read the rest of the series, which you know means that I'm definitely gonna keep this one. So whenever I get around to marathoning this, I'm definitely going to reread this. So yeah, we are keeping Blood of an Exile. And if you don't remember it, this fulfilled the prompt from my Patreon, which was to read a book with the fewest reviews on Goodreads. Okay, and then I DNF'd The Unbroken, um, but this is not one I'm gonna be getting rid of because it's one that I'm going to come back to when I know I'm in the mood for it. So I have vowed, 
that whenever I'm in the mood for it, when another Love It or List It comes around, then I have to read this. And if I don't finish it in that video, then I absolutely have to unhaul it because by that time, it's like what my fourth try. So I really just <laughs> need to get over it. And this isn't so much fulfilling a prompt, but a buddy read on my Patreon, which could be a prompt in and of itself, Friday Black. So this was for the prompt to read a book that I had started and put down. This one I had started and put down on multiple occasions. I finally read through it. Also another one that took me a really long time to read through and one that I don't feel that I comprehended a lot, but I still enjoyed the ride. Am I gonna keep this? I don't think I am. And the reason for that is I just don't see myself wanting to return to this. I would really just like to read another book by this author and just get a whole new experience. So I think that this could have a better home than just sitting on my shelves hoping to be reread. And obviously that's the other thing for me, which I believe I mentioned in the last video, and if I haven't mentioned it in this video, um, if I'm not gonna reread it, there's really no point for me to keep it. Even if I enjoyed it, even if it was like a five stars new favorite, if I don't think I'm gonna reread it, I don't really see the point in having it. So that's just kind of where this is landing. And then Black Girl Unlimited. This is for the prompt that I've given myself for every video to read something that's nonfiction or a memoir. And this is a memoir with some magical elements to it. Again, really enjoyed this, but I don't see myself revisiting it just because of how um, emotionally draining it was, but an absolutely beautiful book. I do highly recommend it. Although again, I'll put the trigger warnings down below for any of these books that have triggers, but especially Black Girl Unlimited. And this is another one that will be listed because I'm not gonna reread it. Here's my bucket with <laughs> my Pango books. Um, I still haven't listed the ones from the last video because I need to organize some things. Also, Jared went through his bookshelves and started unhauling things. So I have a lot of stuff to put on Pango, but I think I'm gonna go through some of them and I'm gonna give them to my bookstore, my local used bookstore. These two, we are listing. They're officially being listed. But we're keeping two, which is exciting, but also like, does it really count since I DNF this. I don't really know, but I'm gonna take it as a win. Anyway, that's episode two of Love It or List It. Thank you so much for watching. I feel like this video is a lot of nonsense and chaos, but my reading slump has officially ended, okay? So I'm just really excited about that. And anyway, I will talk to y'all next time. Bye. Bye.